And that's the truth. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. Folks are coming back from vacation, getting back in the house of God. I'm glad to see that. So I think I'll take one. No, it's good to see you this morning. By the way, my wife just celebrated a birthday here this last week. Y'all give her a praise the Lord and a shout out. I was going to tell you last week that it was coming up during the week, but she was so unhappy about it. <laughs> I would have just been rubbing it in at that point. But she's gotten over it. She's happy now. She's alive and lived another year. I don't know, you know, girls and birthdays. I don't know what it is. So. When they're younger, they can't get there fast enough. They get a little older, they can't forget them fast enough. And <laughs> it's just the way it works. Hey, we're in our study on a, that happy subject of apostasy today. <laughs> It is a happy subject when you realize that you're not one of those that, that are involved in the apostasy of the end times. And as we get into this study, it's been an interesting study, and I think it's a very practical study. It's from the book of Jude, one of those overlooked books in the Bible, just kind of doesn't get much of a read, or you do read it, it's kind of like, oh, okay, what was that all about? Uh, so we're digging into it word by word and line by line and looking a little closer at what the Bible says. And this is very important because it has to do with prophecy in regard to the last days. And these are the things that the Bible said prior to the return of the Lord Jesus, before he came back, uh, that there would be this great move. And we know a lot about, about prophecy in regard. Well, yeah, we know there's going to be a tribulation and an antichrist and all that stuff. Well, this is what the Bible said would precede the antichrist and the tribulation. All right, so you need to understand what's going on here. It is, it is an important subject in the Word of God, and we need to understand it uh, because uh, these are the days we have to give right answers to people. We're living in that day of what I call eclectic religion. You say, that's my own terminology, forgive me for it. But it's kind of the idea of uh, people just embrace whatever feels good for them. And, you know, you, I talk to a lot of people just on the streets and in life, and they say, well, this is the way I feel about it. And this is the way I think, and this is what I've kind of come up with for my, I remember hearing Oprah Winfrey in an interview, they were asking about her religion, and she, that was her, her answer. Well, I kind of take a little bit of everything and kind of put it all together and, you know, and kind of goes into that, and uh, this is what I feel. Well, we all can come up with feelings, you know, it depends if I just had pizza or Mexican food or whatever, you know. I can have a lot of different emotions that I go through. Uh, but when it comes to eternity and truth, there's only one truth, all right? Uh, it, you can't say, uh, emotionally I'm bent this way, mentally I feel this way, and kind of put all these little pieces together and say, okay, that's the way I believe, and stake your eternal life on it, because what you believe may not be right. But Brother Joe, that's the way I feel about it. Well, great that you feel that way, but it doesn't validate it. It doesn't make something truth. So we have to embrace what's right. You say, well, how can we know the truth? Well, God answered that question in the beginning. He established the truth. And he's given it to us in written form even, so that we, we don't have to err. We don't have to guess our way through it. We don't have to kind of cement bits and pieces together. And that's the wisdom of God, is it not? That we don't have to sit and go through this long guessing game. Of, well, is that right? Is this right? I don't know about that. What about this and that? Hey, that's why the Bible says there's just one Lord, one faith, one bad. There's just one truth, okay? One spirit, so that we don't have to be confused. If, if God in his wisdom said, well, let's just make 1,700 ways that you can get to heaven. Well, we would come up with 1,700 more in our own feelings, our own emotions, the way we feel about it. So we can't let things dictate to us what the truth is. Not, and really not even what, what someone said over here, what someone said, but what does the Bible have to say? And apostasy deals with that issue. People will reject the truth. They reject what the Bible has to say. And it said it would be rampant like that in the end time. So as we've got into Jude, we really just kind of got into the introduction last week where we talked about uh, that if you are genuinely embracing the truth of, of Scripture and the Lord Jesus as God's eternal way of salvation, that He is the way, the truth, and the life, then you're safe and you don't have to worry and there's security. So you can, you know, in, in the first couple of verses deal with that. And then even the last verse of the book, we talked about how He's able to present us, you know, preserved. So we know what we looked at those words kept and beloved and what those meant and how that we are under a covenant agreement with God so that if we are genuinely children of God, that cannot be reversed in some format. But there will be people who will have a form of that 
but they will reject the truth of what the Word has to say before all is said and done. So, let me find my little uh, weather changer here. I always think about the weather guy holding these things for some reason. But anyway, if you'll notice, there's a front blowing in from the north. But <laughs> <laughs> Verse 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Verse 4, he says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. They are ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. One translation is lasciviousness. And, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amazing verses here which just give us a little insight to the apostasy and, and what it's really all about. We kind of clarified last week that apostasy is an abandonment or a rejection of the truth. That it just denies the truth no matter what God says. But the apostate is not just someone like perhaps an atheist who says, I don't believe that. But there's someone who comes in looking like they are a believer, but they aren't a believer. It's kind of like Jesus warned, we'll, we'll look at a minute in Matthew, about the wolves in sheep's clothing. They're the people who have a pretend Christianity. So they, they go through the motions of a believer, but ultimately in their life they will reject the truth of God's word and choose to believe lies. Now it's not to be confused with somebody who perhaps is just indifferent. Because we know as Christians we can all get cold hearted. We can be backslidden. We can go through times of rebellion in our life. And God is committed to us as we said last week. That if we get out of his will and reject him in our life that he'll, he'll convict us by his Holy Spirit. And that's part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to convict us and bring us back to Christ. And if we don't listen to the conviction, we know that he begins to chasten us because he's a good father and a heavenly father. And so he chastens us so that we'll respond into righteousness. So an apostate is not somebody who's just a Christian who's gotten to a place of indifference or cold hardness in their life. Nor is it to be confused with somebody who's just in error. There's a lot of strange doctrines out there in the church who some of them are embraced by well-meaning, godly people who just don't take the time to really study the scripture, all right? They just kind of believe whatever's coming down the pike and it's like this, it just changes every day and they kind of change with it every day. So, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning people in well-meaning churches, but they may be off in some area doctrinally. It doesn't mean they're without God and it doesn't mean they're without Christ and it doesn't mean, you know, I, I don't agree with everything that my Pentecost or brothers agree with in, in some areas. But hey, I, I still believe they love Jesus. I have great fellowship with them. You know, I, I have some Assembly God brothers and Nazarene brothers and Methodist brothers that love Jesus and I fellowship with. And I got brothers in Baptist churches even. Can you believe that? Which, which are our one. And some of them I even agree with. So... That doesn't mean that, you know, there's error because we all can be prone to error. That's not the apostate. The apostate is somebody who just rejects the Lord Jesus and rejects the truth. He's received light, but not life. He's gotten what we would say the information, but not the transformation. He has it in his head, but like the old saying goes, he'll miss heaven by about 18 inches, the distance from the head to the heart. He's never had that commitment with his life, and that's what the Bible talks about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that real commitment, that real belief, not just in eternal head belief, not just an informational kind of thing. It's like receiving the difference between uh, the written word and, and uh, the real word, the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. That, you know, I, I kind of kind of grasp what some of the Bible says, but I don't get Jesus. I haven't made him my personal Lord and Savior. I haven't committed my life to follow him as my Savior. I, I perhaps believe a lot of the information of the Bible that Jesus, yes, he was a real historical person, that he did live, and, he, and, he, and his history that we read about him is accurate and, and factual. It, perhaps even believe that he rose from the dead, but yet I've not believed in my heart, and I missed the mark. So this person is a person who's received light, but not life. It's a deliberate rejection ultimately, and this is where it all leads to, where they just finally reject the truth. Second Thessalonians says, they receive not the love of the truth. Now that's talking about, again, where we are in the context of this whole of the message in prophecy, in times. And this is what the Bible's talking about. 
It's, uh, and contextually, he's, he's, he's dealing with this issue of the end times. He's, in 2 Thessalonians, he's getting ready to talk about the Antichrist and how he's going to be revealed and who he is and, you know, that, that what he is and the ultimate liar and how the world's going to follow and believe him. And in and, and 2 Thessalonians, as he's talking about the Antichrist, he says something's going to happen. God's going to allow something to take place in the world so that the world believes on him. And I, for a long time, when I first received the Lord in my life, and I'd read about the Antichrist, about how the whole world's going to follow him, and everybody's, except this, this strategic small group of people, the most of the world is going to accept him and gladly follow him. He's going to be this great, charismatic, political world leader. You know, and, and I said, I just don't think that's true. But since those days, we've pretty much adapted a one-world court system. We have a United Nations. Everything's kind of gone to a global mindset. We're living in a global community, as the world likes to say. And it, 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 add to that, you know, all those things that are lining up. I can easily see when God does what he says he will do in 2 Thessalonians in the end, end times, the people are going to, they're going to reject the truth. In fact, he uses this terminology in 2 Thessalonians. He says, and God will send them a strong delusion that they will believe a lie. In other words, God's going to allow something to happen in the end times so that the people who've rejected the truth, he said they received not the love of the truth, that they'll be deceived because they've already openly been inviting deception in their life by their willful rejection of God. It just makes it worse and they open the door for more deception in their life. And this is, this is all part of this, this end times that where people just reject the truth, they reject the love of the truth. They won't fall in love with Jesus. They won't commit their lives to following him. Remember in Acts chapter 8, there was a guy named Simon who was what you might refer to as a pseudo-believer. He'd gone through all the motions of what was happening in the church. I, you know, I prayed a prayer. I got baptized. They did all these things, but yet in his heart, he was still filled with himself. He had no room for God. It was all about him. And in fact, when he saw the power of the Holy Spirit moving in the apostles, he says, I want to buy that. Why? So I can manipulate people so it's going to be all about me. That's an apostate. He doesn't get it. All right. He, he has this form of godliness, as we'll see in a moment where the scripture talks, talks about, but he, he denied it. He rejected the truth. And Peter tells me, you need to repent. You need to get saved. You need, you need to get right with God. That was the response. This Greek word apostasia in that form is only used two times in the New Testament. In fact, it's used first of all in Acts chapter 2 when they're accusing the apostles of apostatizing the teaching of Moses and falling away from what he taught. He says that they've been told about you that you're teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. And basically they were saying, you're telling these Jews out here that they don't have to. That, so they accused the apostles of, saying, uh, of an apostasy from the law of Moses. And then it goes on again in 2 Thessalonians. We talked about a while ago uh, about the end times. That don't let anybody deceive you in any way. For it will not come unless an apostasy comes first. Before the Antichrist comes, the apostasy will come first. And the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will be revealed the sons of destruction. He said, the Antichrist is coming, but before he gets here, there's going to come this massive rejection of Christianity as a whole. But well, are not we seeing that more and more every day? Does not the media consistently rail against conservative evangelical believers every day? Are they not made light of and fun of almost at every turn? People who embrace the gospel and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life are considered moronic at best, uninformed and unintellectual. That's the culture that Jesus said the world would be like prior to his coming. Now, now even though that's the only two places that it's used in scripture, the idea is all throughout the New Testament. In John 6, uh, verses 66, I've got the interesting verse number, by the way, it's talking about apostasy in that number, that there were great numbers of people following Jesus, so when Jesus turns and addresses them about the cost of really following him, that they literally become one with him, and he's talking about eat my flesh, drink my blood, those Jews understood he was talking about a covenant relationship, although people read that today in a Gentile format and think he's talking about cannibalism or something. No, he's talking about a covenant relationship. He's basically telling them, you have to deny yourself and follow me. It says they didn't like that. And many went back from following him on that day. They, they, they were all about the emotional. They were all about the intellectual. They liked what Jesus did. You know, they saw the miracles. They saw the power. But when it came down to, hey, you're going to have to follow him with your life. They didn't like that. They didn't like that. But that kind of fits in with the culture that we're in today, though. You know, we have a lot of people who fill churches today 
who like to hear the sermons and hear about the hope and heaven and all the blessings and the prosperity and the success and the peace and the joy and the eternal life, you know, and heaven, but yet their lives are not committed to Christ at all in reality. They go about their lives with business as usual, doing whatever they please and whatever they desire. There's no commitment there to Christ. First John, John talked about, he says, who is the liar that's apostate? The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. What's that mean? He says, anybody that falls in this parameter of rejecting Jesus as the answer, God's answer for man's need, God's answer for man's sin, God's answer for salvation, then that person is a liar. In other words, if you say that Jesus is not the way, the truth, and the life, it says you lie. That's, that's the idea of rejection of the truth in person. It's re- the truth of the Word of God as well. You reject the truth of God's Word. Again, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's again talking prophetically. In the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing doctrines and, 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 and uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. What's happening here is that they're going to reject the truth and they're going to believe lies. They're going to be, believe things that they're going to come into the church and believe these truths and they're going to fall for it and they're going to accompany themselves with false teachers and false churches and false preachers and false congregation. Now apostasy is nothing new. It literally began in the garden in the beginning. When God comes to Eve and says, Hath God said? The questioning of the authority of what God says. That still continues today. I know what the Bible says. I know the Bible says it is the word of God, but then comes along all the excuses and ramifications and and all the reasons why you're not really going to commit yourself to do what God says. It's nothing new. We've seen it throughout Scripture. Even in Israel, there's this apostasy that came into Israel and went to Babylonian captivity. I mean, you, you see it over again. In church history, under Constantine, in 325 A.D., there was, this, there was this departure from the grace of God and opening the door to more apostasy, kind of leading to this idea that works can save you, that you, it's not by grace alone, it's by works. Out of that, the Catholic Church that came up saying, you know, salvation only comes through the church, of, of the Catholic Church. It's it's not through the name of Jesus. It's not through the power of Jesus. It's not through the blood of Jesus. It's through the sacraments. It's through Mary. She's a co-redeemer. All those things, you know, basically say, well, I know what the Bible says, but we're going to add something to it. We're going to help it out a little bit. The Bible doesn't need your help. It's complete. It's final. It is thorough. During the Reformation, when a lot of people began to turn from that, you know, say, well, it may perhaps it's not in the church. And by the way, any church that tells you they're the way to salvation is a lying church. This church is not the way to salvation. Jesus is the only way to be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by the Baptist. I don't think so. No man comes to the Father but by the Catholics. I don't think so. Church of Christ, Methodist, you know, no. It's in Jesus only. Only in Christ are we saved. You ought to praise the Lord for that. Again, doesn't that do away with the confusions when we get that 1700 religion thing going again? It makes it clear. It's concise. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Well, how better could it be? But even during the Reformation, when people began to turn from that and began to understand the grace of God, that it's not works, it's not by being a better person, being moral, and, you know, just being a decent individual, trying the best you can, but that God had provided salvation through His Son and had given us grace. But even during that time, there was a revival of intellectualism mysticism, a denial of biblical authority, all these things have continued to go on. And now, here in this generation, in this century, we're kind of seeing the apex of everything that is going on. And that's why Jude writes to the church, he says, you know, I mean, Paul wrote to the church, he said, there's going to be teachers, and people are going to follow them. Teachers that will just tell them whatever they want to hear. Boy, that's certainly the, 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 the pro today. Of course, we like to hear good stuff. I, I like to preach good stuff. As the Lord leads certain passages, it, it's, it's fun to talk about the blessings of God. But that's not for every Sunday. That's like eating dessert for every meal. I like it, but it's not right. It'll kill you. <laughs> it'll ruin your health. It'll ruin your life. You know, so you have to have truth. I, I've had people leave the congregation at different times in our own church and say, well, you just, you know, you just preach that stuff that's just not easy to hear. Well, it isn't easy to hear, you know. But any more than when I was a two-year-old, Mama said, wash your hands. I didn't want to hear that. 
Well, you know where my hands have been as a two-year-old? You know where your hands have been as a 22-year-old? 82 years old? Wash your hands. <laughs> Whether you like to hear it or not. It's just understanding that if I wash my hands, I better... Like, but let's talk about the most important thing. It's not your physical life. It's your spiritual life. And you need truth. It's truth that liberates you. And it's not always comfortable. And it's not always convenient. But if that's what you want, then, then you're going to open yourself up for this lie that's going to be so part, big part of the culture that we live in. So Jude tells the church, listen, I was going to write to you about the common salvation. I want to tell you about all the great things that God has done for us. And I was going to write to you about the common salvation, he said, but I felt it was necessary. In other words, it's needful, as this word means. It's like a divine pressure was put on me to change my letter. God had something he wanted to say to you that you need to hear. I felt it, I felt under divine compulsion is what he's saying here. To I was going to write to you about one thing. Let's talk about heaven. Let's talk about the blood. Those are all great subjects. Talk about the cross. That's great. But you need to understand there are some important things that I need to warn you about. And isn't it interesting how many, how many times throughout the word of God from day one to the last day description that God warns us because we need to be warned? about things that are out there, about things that can destroy our lives. He said, I thought it was needful that I write to you about the, and contend but for the, to earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now the word here for contend is the word for boxing, by the way. It's a Greek word, agon, which we get the word agony from. Y'all know what agony is? You know, under stress, pressure. He said, I want you to get out there and I want you to stand and fight for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. Who am I fighting against? I'm fighting against the lies. I'm fighting against the enemy. I'm fighting against this world system in so many ways. I'm fighting against Satan and all his lies. That's, that when he says, as God say, I'd say, yes, God said. What does that really mean? It means what it says. Well, that's not the way I see it. Hey, the Bible says it's not for private interpretation. You can't sit there and say, well, this is what it means to me. Now, I know a lot of our Bible studies and churches go like, well, what's that mean to you? Now, what we need to ask is, what does that mean to God? What was God saying and what did God mean when he said that? Somebody say amen a little louder. Amen. amen. I mean, we all like to push our happy feely button and what it means to us. But hey, the important button push is, is the button. What God says, this is what he meant. Yes. And interesting about God, he doesn't dilly dally around and dance around the flowers. He just says it like it is. Don't you love that? So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand for the truth. The truth that was once for all delivered to the saints. In fact, he says the same thing that the apostle does when, when he writes to the church, uh, when he writes to Timothy in fir his first letter and his second letter. In both of those, he first of all he tells Timothy, fight. And then he gets to the end of his life. He says, I fought. I've been fighting. I fought for the, I fought for the faith. And also, it's not, it's not coincidental when it says to stand and fight for the faith. It doesn't say the faiths, plural. You hear a lot of that today. Well, uh, there's many faiths. No, there's not. There's many religions. And religion is something that man concocts. The man says, if you do this, this, and this, then you can reach God. Where God says, no, it's not what you do, it's what I do. Where faith is, 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 is my, I'm basing my life and my eternity and my belief system on what he said. All right, what God said. That is the faith that was once for all. In other words, there's not many faiths. There's only one faith. And the Bible makes it clear, one Lord, one faith. So you say, well, well, what about Buddhism and what about Islam? And all? They are religions. And there's a difference between religion and the gospel. Yes. And our life, our faith, our commitment is based upon not what some man put together after he had some angelic revelation over here from Moroni or whoever. It's based upon what does God's word tell us? That's the basis of truth, and that's where I choose to place my, my heart and my life. I'll stand in agony if necessary. I'll stand wherever God wants me to stand, and I'll contend for the truth of God's Word. You say, well, I just don't know if that's necessary to do. Boy, I'll tell you how, how far off, if you really want to discover how far off we have gotten as a culture, walk into work on Monday morning and say something like this to all your workers, friends, and neighbors. Say, you know... The Bible says there's only one way to get to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And we have to believe that he's God's son, he was raised from the dead, and he's coming back again. 
<laughs> you know what's going to happen. The sparks are going to fly. How can you be so narrow-minded? I tell people all the time, it's easy when you're right. <laughs> Amen. It's pretty simple when you're basing what you're saying, not on your feelings, your emotions, your logic, your intellect, but on what God simply said. So are you willing to stand and fight that fight? Then go start a fight. No, just stand when the fight starts. Now, he says that the faith that was once for all delivered. Proverbs 30 puts it this way. Do not add to his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. In other words, I don't take and say, well, here's what it means to me. Here's what I think. Or, you know, here's what the angel told me that meant. You know, no, this is what God said. In fact, the Bible clearly ends with a warning. I mean, in the, in the last book of the Bible, it says, if any man shall add unto this book, a plague's written there and shall be upon him. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That's why, you know, I, I get rid of all these addendum Bibles, you know. The addendum Bibles are the things like Jehovah Witness and the Book of Mormon and things like that. They're, they're, they don't agree with this book, then why should I read them? They're contrary to what has already been said. Basically, they're saying, oh, <clears throat> this is what God said originally. Oh, yeah, we believe that, but he made some changes. And here's the revised version. You know, this is version 2.01, whatever it might be. No. It's already settled. It's once for all delivered. And that ought to give us peace and that ought to bring some sense of security to know that, hey, it's all, I have something I can stand on that I don't have to go to bed and I say, well, I hope I'm right. Mm -hmm. What if I'm wrong? I know I can know. And that, that's the beauty of it. God says, not only will you step out in faith, you trust me. Then it says, if you believe the truth, that he will send a confirmation. It says his Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. God says, I'll confirm it. You'll know that you belong to me, that you're a child of God. Verse 4, he says, he gives the reasons for the apostasy and how it works. And he, he, he describes in his, the, the reason for the letter. He says, I want you to contend for the faith because there are certain men. Then he describes them. There are some people who want to pervert it. There's some people who want to twist it. There's some people who want to change it. And I think I spoke to you before, we've talked about open theism, which is probably the most popular movement among churches today. Open theism basically says, you know, yeah, God wrote this, but he's still changing. He's still, he's still, he's, he hadn't worked it all out just yet. He hadn't worked it all out. But, so as he, as he works it out, you know, yeah, basically that was wrong yesterday, but that means wrong today, that the Bible's still being written. And then I, I love the movement that came about in churches. Uh, and in fact, most every denomination had to fight this fight. And the fight is over this. Is the Bible the word of God? Yeah. All right. Uh, and there's lots of denominations that have moved the other direction. I mean, the United Methodist Church went that, the other direction and said, well, you know, and many of those churches split off and said, well, you know, we just we, we, we don't believe the Bible is infallible and inerrant. You know, we just, you know. And, and you ask them and say, well, what? Wh what do you believe? Well, we, we, we believe the Bible's inspired in places. You know, it's inspired in some, in some spots. And we're inspired to spot the spots. I said, you know, that's amazing. That's brilliant. I said, in fact, I read it and, and I see that every spot's inspired. <laughs> it's inspired all the way through. Why can I say it? Because that's what the Bible says of itself. It makes this declaration. It's not like any book in your house. There's, there's no other book in all the world that's ever been written that's anything like what the Bible is because it is inerrant. It's without, it's without error. It's, it's inspired by God. In other words, it's a living book. You say, how do you know it's alive? Because when I read it and believed it, it literally transformed my life and your life if you read it and believed it. God did a supernatural work. The Spirit of God went to work. But there's certain people who reject the truth and they creep in unaware. Catch this. He gives a, he gives a kind of a, a three, threefold description. He talks about, first of all, how they, they penetrated. Basically, he says, you know, they, they, they worm their way in. I like this word, they creep. In other words, they're creepy. <laughs> These creepy people, they come in, they worm their way in. And, they, and this is exactly what's happened in so many of our major schools. I remember, the, you know, in, in the beginning, Harvard and Princeton and, and Yale and Dartmouth, all those were seminaries. Can you believe that? In the early stage of American history, they were seminaries. But what happened then? We had some creeps. People crept in, unaware. In other words, the church was sleeping. The, those who knew the truth didn't do something about it. They let it happen. 
They crept in unaware, penetrated. They penetrated their way into the seminaries, into the colleges, into the school systems, and they have corrupted. In fact, in Scripture, it gives us, Jesus told us that, they, that they'll come in. He said they'll come in, in Matthew, he said, like, like sheep's, like wolves in sheep's clothing. Or sheep's, basically, they want to pretend to be, but they're really just wolves. Their agenda, they have one. And their agenda is to pervert the truth. It's a legal term it talks about here in Scripture about creeping in. It's the idea of being a pleader, like a, somebody, a very clever lawyer who's able to present his case and mislead you to the proper, take you to the wrong conclusions to the proper conclusion. They'll use seductive words. In fact, over and over when it's talking about this kind of work within the church, it uses this kind of terminology. It says they'll speak good words. It's the word eulogia in the Greek language. It means they'll speak nice words to get you to believe what is not necessarily the truth. In fact, it would be a lie. If you choose to believe it, you're in trouble. He said, but they'll come in, they'll worm their way in, they'll penetrate, and they come in to corrupt the doctrine of Scripture, to corrupt the truth of God's Word, to twist it, to change it. The second thing it says about them is that uh, not only do they penetrate, seek in to corrupt the doctrine, but they're predicted. He said, there they were ordained for this. Now, when it talks about ordaining him, now we dealt a little bit with about, you know, preordination and the sovereignty of God and election versus Arminianism, the idea of, you know, it's just your will and what you do, and talked about how those, those two camps are very popular. We, so if you, didn't, you weren't here, you can't get that DVD or CD and you request it in the service. There's forms on the back table because so, I'm not going to rehearse all that again. It took too long to do it then. But in doing that, you know, one camp would say, well, what this scripture is saying is that these guys, God picked them out to be apostates beforehand. But that's not what it's saying. If you take and break down the actual language of the scripture, the idea here is, is, is that the, the judgment that was ordained, it, it was the, the punishment that's ordained, not the men, all right? In other words, if you are an apostate, you're, it's already settled what's going to happen to you. It's already been pre-written, all right? God didn't pick them out to judge them. The emphasis, the emphatic, is the judgment will take place upon people who choose to believe a lie. The Greek word, well, I'll let you pronounce it for me after church, all right? So write it down, and it's basically that the program's been written where we get the word from. It's been programmed. Now, four times it's just by, that word is used in Scripture, but only once, and in, 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 in here it is in Jude, it's where they are ordained for this. But the idea is that the ordination is towards judgment. In other words, if you don't believe truth and you don't embrace Jesus, you really don't have any hope. Especially if you're going to be someone who will pervert or seek to pervert the truth in any regard. You, are certainly been, you have certainly picked a path which is going to lead to judgment because it's already been settled what's going to happen to people who live that kind of way and teach that way. It means pre-written. So apostasy was pre-written by God that when it occurred, it would be condemned forever. The third thing is, is how they're portrayed here. All right, and the portrayal is interesting. They're portrayed in, in three different ways. He talks, about their, he talks about their creed, their character, their conduct here. And let me just take a moment to deal with each one of these because he, he pinpoints it in this verse of Scripture. He says, first of all, he says, you know, they are ungodly. They're ungodly. They deny the authority of Scripture. In fact, 2 Timothy, Paul wrote about him. He says, they will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power of it. They'll look good on the outside, but inside... There's no reality. There's no Jesus. There's no spirit. There's no life. They look good, but he said, ultimately, I love the word, just ungodly. And what does that mean? Not like God. <laughs> Pretty simple, isn't it? They're not like God at all. God's not like what they're describing him to be. That's God's truth as they're portraying it is, is not the truth of God. They talk about theology. They talk about scriptures. They've memorized some, perhaps some, some verses but there's really no place for God in their life. And so they're trying to give you all the reasons why they are what they are and how they are. They're without God. They deny the truth of God. The second thing I want to talk to you about was their conduct. And he says, you know, they turn the grace of God into licentiousness or to lasciviousness, which literally means they pervert the grace of God. Now, this is happening on a lot of, a lot of levels today. There's a lot of people say, well, I'm under grace, so I just do what I want to do. 
You know, Jesus died for my sins. I'm going to heaven. And God, God just, they think that grace is God just overlooking their problems or their sins or whatever it is. And because God is so gracious, it's just okay to go do what you want to do. In fact, the way one guy described it to me one time, he said, well, the Bible says, I always love it when they get that there. When the Bible says, you know, that where sin is, grace much more abounds. So I've got lots of grace abounding around me. Follow the logic of that. Paul wrote the church earlier before this. He said, you know, the grace of God teaches us that we should deny ungodliness. Yes. <laughs> so what's that mean? If you're under grace, it means you just want to reject what's not like God. What's not like God? Now, Paul said all things, you know, are, are lawful for me. In other words, there's some things that I can do. He said, but I won't do them. And as a Christian, there's some things that, you know, that probably would not offend God, but I won't do them. In fact, I kind of measure, you say, well, is this right? Is that right? And what about this? And what about that? And everybody's got all these little areas that we're just kind of discussing. And what about this sin? And what about that? Is that sin? I I put it down to three things. One, if it's going to offend God, it's sin. I don't know if it's going to offend God. Well, I have the Holy Spirit. I got the Word of God. All right? All right? So I'm not going to commit adultery. One, because my wife would kill me. (laughs) Two, because God said don't do it. Well, number one, I love my wife, all right? Now, the world says, oh, no, 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 adultery's okay. Adultery's okay. I mean, you said, well, the world doesn't say that. Watch any primetime TV show in America. You got people hopping in and out of bed with each other, married, unmarried, they're all, you know, it's just, just do whatever makes you feel good, you know? That's the culture we live in. But these guys... They want to pursue their life of ungodliness, and so they just use the grace of God as the, as the excuse. I'm under grace. I can do what I want to do. So I don't want to offend God. Number two, I don't want to offend you. So God may say that's okay, but at the same time, if I, Paul said, if it's going to cause your brother to stumble, then don't do it. Just don't do it. How many of you would like to walk into the restaurant after church is over today and see me sitting there with a big old you know, margarita in my hand? Boy, don't you know Facebook would light up. <laughs> We'd be twi- tweeting all our twits and everything else. <laughs> you know, so this is the things that's going to cause somebody to stumble. I'm not going to do it. You know, I may justify it even with Scripture, but I'm just not going to do it because it's not worth it. It's just, I'd rather, the third thing is my conscience. Paul said, if your conscience offends you, don't do it. If I can't get a if it's just something, you say, I don't know if my conscience offends me. You know. If you'll be honest and transparent and honest and sincere, you'll know. So just don't do it. Their conduct, though, is just the opposite. They excuse everything they do and use the grace of God. Let me just read this past 2 Peter. By false prophets arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. They'll deny the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their what? Sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth is going to be maligned. We're seeing that everywhere. They say they're Christians, but look how they behave. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. Romans 1 puts it this way. Paul says they'll change the truth of God into a lie. He wrote Titus. He says, Titus, listen, they profess they know God, but in works they deny him. Their conduct, it's without God. Their, their character is to take the grace of God and pervert the grace of God so that they can excuse their sensuality, so they can excuse their greed, so they can excuse their lifestyle. And he talks about their creed. He says they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Basically saying he's just a man or they want to remove his deity or make him like any other man. Paul said in the last days doctrines of demons would come into the church. 1 John 4 says they confess that Jesus is not come, that Jesus Christ has not come to the flesh. Now not, he's not saying that Jesus, they're, not, they're denying that Jesus came. He, they're saying that Jesus being the Christ has come in the flesh. That God is in the flesh and that he's your answer for salvation. They don't believe that. Because they want to believe that they just be good enough and they just be sincere and they just be, you know, nice and that that's all it takes. But the Bible says, you know, it's not of works lest any man should boast. There's no room for arrogance. There's no room for pride. It's just God's grace. And he deals with, he, and he labors on, on these four words. Look at them. He calls him a Lord God and he calls him our Lord. And he says Jesus and he's the title of Christ. Lord God is the term despot in the Greek language. We get a despote. We get the word despot from that. Somebody like who's on, he's an absolute monarch, you know. Nobody... He's accountable to no one. He does whatever he wants. Well, let me tell you, man being a despot is bad news. God being a despot is fantastic news. Basically saying that God is sovereign. 
God said, there's nobody like me. There's nobody before me. There's nobody after me. I am God. There is no other. You should have no other gods before you. Because why? I'm God. I'm the only God. I am. That's it. He's God. Well, I don't like him. You're going to have to deal with him on that. I don't want to follow him. That's going to be a problem. That's got consequences. And the amazing part of it, this God is not just God. He is our Lord. And when he talks about Jesus, it's the word curios. When I preached this at Christmas a couple of years ago, we talked about all the titles for Jesus. And this is one of them. It was the title of distinction. Jesus did not give himself that name. The Father has given the name above all names that every knee should bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's a different word. So it's, he's not repeating himself. He said that, that God is sovereign and Jesus has been given this, this, this headship over all things, that he is Lord and that he is also, his name is Jesus, which means God is salvation, Jehovah's salvation, and he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the answer. He's God's anointed and appointed one. He's God's way to get to heaven. He's God's way to life. He's God's way to fullness. He's God's way to knowing God. He's God's way to freedom. And he said, they deny that. They deny that. And so the battle really gets down to this is, you know, is, is who is Jesus with them? Is Jesus really God? Is he, did his blood that he shed on the cross really cover us and save us and atone, make atonement for our sins? And they no, we don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need the blood. That's why major denominations are removing those kind of hymns that talk about the blood and the cross because it's offensive to some. That's all part of that creeping in unaware. Say, well how, well, how do we contend for the faith then? I'll close with these four points, five points, whatever it is. One with your lips. Stand up. Don't be afraid to confess Jesus as Lord. Do not let the world intimidate you. Don't be arrogant. Don't be mean. Always walk in love. But hey, stand for the truth. When people are saying idiotic things, just say the truth. Don't do it with arrogance. Don't do it with pride. Don't do it with malicious heart. But do say the truth. No, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to cause problems here, but the Bible says, you know, and, and, and I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the answer. Speak up. But also, you know, walk what you talk. You know, because don't be the biggest hypocrite of all. Go around and, and say things, but don't live it in your life. That's arrogance and that's hypocrisy, and God's not going to smile on that either. Most important, you love God with all your heart. And by the way, I put it on the screen, you can't love God without loving His Word. Jesus is the living Word. This is His written Word. This is His answer. We embrace this because we've embraced Him. We embrace the Bible because I don't worship the Bible, I worship God. And I love God. And I understand how much God loves me and all he's done for me and the sacrifice. Even when I didn't want to be saved, he was paying the price. And obviously with our lucre, you know, we support the body of Christ. We support the church. We support the preaching of the word when we support the church. I believe what the Bible says. Therefore, I'm going to get behind the only institution that's doing something about it. And that's his bride, the church of the living God. I support it. Why? Because I love God. And if I love God with everything I am, that involves everything. My life, my lips, my walk, my life, my money. I'm just going to serve God. Earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And it really gets down, first of all, of Jesus. What are you going to do with Christ? Pilate tried to wash his hands of him. He didn't want to do that. <laughs> Others have sought to crucify him. Others have thought just to ignore him. Others have thought, sought to seek him. Wise men still seek him. You can't get around the historical fact that Jesus existed. I mean, there's more proof about the evidence of Jesus Christ there is than there is of Caesar Augustus or George Washington. We have more historical facts and truth about Jesus than any other character in history. But I've got to believe the truth about what's written, not my own concept. And what I want to twist the scriptures to mean. I got to believe the truth. But what happens in the day that we're living in is fully described to us. Right before the days of Antichrist will come a departure. Because people seek to pervert the truth. People who will choose to believe a lie rather than the truth. My prayer is that you're a person who's made up your mind and said, you know, I believe that Jesus is the truth. And I believe that God's word is a book of truth. And I believe that God loved me enough to send his son Jesus to die for me. And I'm not only going to commit my life to him, I'm committing my mouth to him, my words to him, my walk to him, my life to him. And then be that kind of person who's willing to contend for the faith. Even if it's not popular, 
even if it's not accepted, even though you've been mocked at, spit on, laughed at, contend for the truth. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Come on down. Now, Austin, he gave his uh, life to Christ at VBS, and he has a couple of things he'd like to share. I gave my life to Christ at VBS, and I, and I want to spend the rest of my life with him. Amen. Me too. Amen. <laughs> hey, guys, Austin, how we doing? profession of faith, I now, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, have a good day, guys. There you go. See you later, Gator. Don't let the walk rock it out. <laughs> See y'all later. Next, we have Lily Shaw. Little Munchkins. Maybe. Now, Lily came to know the Lord last year at camp, so she has also a couple words she'd like to share. A year ago at Children's Camp, I got saved. It took me a while to get baptized, but I'm glad I finally did. I wanted to have a closer relationship with God, and I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Lily, on your profession of faith, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think that's, that's three Sundays now. We've